the map what I want to talk to you about for a while. Beautiful, beautiful things, Jungle Cruise. Sound good? Okay. Uh, my book, the Skipper Stories, is all just stories of skippers and the pranks they pulled and the wild things they did and all the stuff we got away with that management still doesn't know a whole lot about. And so this is a, a, a schematic of the, of the part of the attraction. Here's, um, the idea. Here's Main Street. This is City Hall. And there's the fire station with Walt's apartment on top of it. And it's right behind where uh, the jungle cruise is, where the eucalyptus trees are. They're still the same trees that were there from before the park was built. And there's our little boat store behind Main Street in the back. And uh, well, now there's Indiana Jones, right? Walkway, but anyway, you can see where the tree house is and all that kind of good stuff. So I thought we would talk about that. Uh, Walt was really mad when they were building the park because he thought he was used to building things like. Um, they just started doing live action movies, and he thought, well, they're going to be sets, like movie sets. And I got guys that can build sets, and they had to tell them, well, these are sets that people are going to use every day. So it's not like we're going to use it once, and then that's it. Like at the jungle, he wanted to, well, you said you worked at the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? Mm -hmm. He wanted to use the serpent, the, the, this giant squid octopus sea oh. serpent. He wanted to use it in the Jungle Cruise. So it's, we built it. It's huge, and we can have... And they thought, well, there's going to have to be a lot of pulleys and wires. And they told him it was made for a movie where you use it for like a week. And it was rotting. Yeah. No so you got to actually see it. Oh, yeah. And what was the condition? It was rotting. <laughs> they were right. Take that. Well, um, here's Walt with his hand on his hip. That's his general sign of if he's not happy. He's sitting there like, all right. But he thought they were wasting all of his money on concrete. And he said, by the time they're done with all this, I won't have any money left to build my park. But they told him we had to put foundations for buildings and you know, normal things like that so it can last forever. And so he was there upset that they were using too much concrete to build what we call the backside of water and pull these plants up. And that's not where people can see the money if you're you know, lying in a riverbed with clay and whatnot. And so he was always worried, always kind of um, obsessed about that. Let's see what else I got. Uh, the man he hired to be the art director. Uh, he, there was an art director for each different land of the park. And uh, this gentleman right there, Harper Goff, was the one uh, who got to do the work for uh, Adventureland. So he, there they are, obviously, a very, very early version of the boats before opening day. But Harper Goff, great guy, amazing, incredibly talented uh, art designer, art director for different movies. He worked on, I have it on there, on Casablanca. Looks familiar? Very uh -huh. right, good. And uh, he worked on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, so they took a lot of the stuff, like the shields from the natives, and just moved it. I didn't even know there was a natives scene. I had to go back and watch the movie. Oh, wow. So he did some beautiful work at these different sets. Um, and Bill Evans. Bill Evans, they call him a landscape architect. That's what Disney, he wasn't a landscape architect. He was more of a horticulturalist or an advanced gardener. Is that a fancier word? Yeah. I don't know what the word is, but uh, I learned from my landscape architecture friends that he wasn't trained in that. He'd gone to Stanford, but he studied geology, and his dad ran uh, a nursery in Los Angeles. But um, on San Vicente Boulevard in Brentwood, in Los Angeles, there are a couple, well, at least a mile and a half of these giant South African coral trees. They're huge, beautiful trees. Those were brought into America from little cuttings that Bill Evans' dad had taken from South Africa when he was in the Navy. And the Bill Evans had done similar things, sending seeds home to his parents from different places around the world. So the Evans Nursery was famous. Guys like Clark Gable and other actors went there because he got, he had plants that you couldn't find anywhere else in the U.S., mostly because they couldn't grow anywhere else in the U.S. And so we had, the climate here was, you know, wouldn't get too cold. Uh, here maybe in Florida. And so he had a, and I like this, this was, this was 1950, uh, 1959, as you can see the Columbia's in the background. This is when they were building for the Pirates of the Caribbean as they were tearing it out. Originally I thought it was Jungle Cruise, and I thought, that's the Columbia. And it wasn't there then. But look how, that, this truck was already 30 years old, 40 years old. And, that, and look how, it's beautiful condition. I don't know if you can tell, but the tires are brand new. I showed that to my father in law he goes, well, he's the boss man. They always drive the nice cars. <laughs> But that's him bringing stuff in for Pirates of the Caribbean as they were building it up. But Bill Evans and his, his brother Jack, who passed away soon after the, uh, the park was built, um, they, were the, they did a lot of landscape designs because they had this nursery. Walt said, hey, come design my new house that he built in Holmby Hills, in Beverly Hills. 
And so he laid out all the plants for the railroad tracks and whatnot that Walt had in his backyard. Bill Evans did it. And while he was doing that, he said, hey, watch how we build my Disneyland park. And they didn't have experience in plant design. They were gardeners and ran a nursery. And so they didn't have a lot of hand-sketched designs. They just went for it and kind of thought, here's where things should go, and it'll be nice here. And, and they, uh, Disney liked them and kept them on. He, he stayed there till he passed away in August of 2002. And in the summer, so early, obviously earlier than that, the spring or summer of 2002, I was at the Jungle Cruise when he came by. And uh, I saw him, and there was a bunch of plaids, you know, the people from City Hall, they had called plaids. That's always bad news, right? If you work at Disneyland, you remember, see the plaids, someone's getting fired, or somebody's famous walking by. If it's a jungle cruise, that means we're about to do something to that person that will get us fired. So, um, but he came walking with a bunch of them, we're like, oh, this is somebody big, and I'm like, that guy looks familiar. I'm like, oh, it's Bill Evans. And uh, they put him in a boat, and... Uh, they wouldn't let us go. But they filmed him. He was pointing out different trees that were still there. And they had a guy running around in the jungle because a lot of the, the, all the trees have little tags, metal tags in the rack, uh, so they could identify which trees were which and when they were planted and where, how long they'd been there. And so he was pointing out different trees. And uh, I was able to find out something really exciting last, last week. You know the great story? Well, let me finish this, then we'll get to the cool story. Um, Harper Goff was the art director and designer, so he modeled it after the African queen. He thought, here's so the early boat designs for jungle look like this. Now, is Walt going to allow something like that in his park? <clears throat> no, well, today, that's what they look like. But if you want it nice and clean, like the Haunted Mansion, on the outside, it's clean and pretty and nice and perfect, and it can fit in Irvine. So, but <laughs> that's when Queen had come out, and they, Walt loved it, and Harper Goff loved it, and said, this is what I'm going to plan the design after, and it ran with it that way. But the person who really is kind of one of the unsung heroes of Disneyland is Ruth Shellhorn. Are you familiar with her? She's an amazing woman that, that I don't think intentionally, but was kind of written out of the history of Disneyland, which is why they should let historians write history. Okay, good. She was the only, yeah, yeah. only woman there at, at the construction site. She was one of, the, one of the only female senior art directors yeah. there. He came by the park every Saturday for his major walk around with all the little, with all the other you know, directors, and she was the only woman working there. And this was still the 50s. So it was still impressive that, that he, she got the job because she was, he came and said to a friend of his that the Evans brothers are good, but they're not designing stuff. They're spending their time at Disneyland planting things. They're not designing things. And we need blueprints and plans. And so that's when he suggested, who yeah. do you know? And they said, Ruth. So they kind of brought her in and said, okay, you're going to be a landscape architect. But they didn't really tell Bill Evans that they weren't really the landscape architects anymore. Yeah. They kind of kept it. Muddy on purpose. But they kept her out for a while, I believe, in the studio. Yeah, she stayed in the studio and yeah. made plans, and then she wanted to see how they were being done in real yeah. life, and that's when she got mad that they yeah. were being done differently. Because, you know, that's and how it's taught her in school. Yeah, the, you know, the, the stakes are set up, you have surveyors, and the stakes, everything's just so. Yeah. Well, they would get knocked over by trucks or by workers, <laughs> and then you'd have to hire the guys to come. You just couldn't stick them back up if they got. They had to come out and redo it, and Walt was mad that they were wasting a lot of money hiring these guys to come back out. Uh -huh. So he told Harper Goff, just eyeball it. They fall out, <laughs> just stick them back, and just eyeball it. And so they've been doing that a lot. And she was used to, uh, you plan it out, and then they work from those plans. Well, they were already building it, and they had a deadline that they couldn't miss. Yeah. So she would have these plans, and they would already be beyond it. So as time went by, she took on more and more responsibility. Here they are by the Main Street, um, straight Main Street. Is the it the Main Street or no, Frontier? Oh, it's like Frontier. 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 That's what I said. That's what I said. That's what I said. I said Frontier Land. That's what I meant to say. All right. Because it's yellow. The, other one, the Main Street one's not yellow. I should have figured that one out. The uh, one no one's allowed, you can't, you don't, yeah, because it's across the train tracks from you. So the rest of us, we're all down here looking at it. They got to be inside of it. Um, but she ended up being in charge of, she designed everything else in the park except for Adventureland. Yeah. And I had spent all my time working on Adventureland and researching the jungle. So it was the Evans Brothers, the Evans Brothers, the Evans Brothers. And I came across her name. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. A woman in senior management in the 50s. That's pretty, that's yeah. impressive. So what'd she do? I'm like, well, she did everything else. Okay, good to know. <laughs> she did everything else. And, um, but yeah, they called her mother Shellhorn and, and she didn't, she didn't, uh, after it was done, Walt kept the Evans brothers and didn't keep her. And right. it was mostly because he thought that those guys 
got along better. Long. It was yeah. just like, just build it, put it up, get it done. Exactly. Plant it. And it worked for him. I mean, it, it worked. It did. It shouldn't have. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it did. But it did, yeah. Oh, it's a yeah. fascinating woman. Yeah. And so Disney doesn't really talk about her a whole lot because she yeah. left right after. And they list the Evans brothers as the official landscape architects. Yes, I know. And they were more planters and but they did Jungle Cruise Adventureland. So that's what I was excited about. Yeah. <laughs> There's a plan of Adventureland. That's me. What it was supposed to do is this is a Harper Goff drawing of what he thought it might, uh, hoped it might look like. And um, oh, there was the story about the orange trees, right? That was a great story that they ran out of money. Uh, that the Evans brothers did a lot. He, because he worked in the Beverly Hills area of Los Angeles, they needed mature trees. And so he and Harper Goff drove around those neighborhoods looking for trees that owners might be willing to sell. And they, they had, Harper Goff had a lot of cash. And they would walk up and say, we'll give you 200 bucks for your tree. People would say, okay, fine. <laughs> take it. And Disney would come up, box it, and take it. And they saw this, in Beverly Hills, this house, a huge banyan, Florida banyan tree, huge. And so they were really nervous because it was so beautiful. And the house was obviously a very rich person's. And they went up to the house and said, we'd you know, like to take that tree. And the guy goes, that old ugly thing? I hate that tree. So the deal they made with him was, we'll just dig it up, take it out, and stick a new tree in for you, whatever you like. And I said, fine. And they estimate the tree would have cost maybe five or six thousand dollars to buy it from a nursery that size, and they got it for the cost of another tree and just a couple of guys to dig it out. And so that's one way he got a lot of trees. Another way was one of his friends was a landscape architect for Caltrans, and he knew where the freeway was being built and when construction was going on. And so he would uh, have his workmen show up in these Disney trucks or the Evans trucks, and they would pay the Caltrans workers twenty-five bucks to pick out trees that they could leave. Because you don't have to do anything, just leave them alone. Here's 25 bucks, leave the tree alone, and we're going to take it. And they got a lot of big, because they needed big, mature trees. And that's one of the great things that the Evans brothers did, is they picked mature trees, and they also picked little trees, because they wanted it to grow um, over time. Does that make sense? A lot of people want a garden, they want it to look perfect right away. And then it gets overgrown and the next year. But he wanted to be able to grow and kind of be an integrated jungle, so he put things in at different age levels. But eventually they ran out of money, and he was ordering seed packets in the mail, <laughs> and planting stuff in little containers and hoping it would, it would work. Um, but there's a story about the orange trees. There was, I, did, I found this out, there were two types. They would took so, they would took? <laughs> Me speaks good, the English. Um, they took some orange trees and just stuck them in, uh, stuck them in the back parts of scenes, upright, like they planted them as real orange trees because they figured if there's bushes and plants, orange tree won't notice it. They just told the gardeners, trim it so it doesn't produce fruit, that would be bad. Other ones, you know the story that they took and stuck them upside down, mm -hmm. and they would cover them with vines and whatnot, and to give it, if all the roots were coming out, it would look all jungly and mysterious. And I found this out two weeks ago, there's one still there. And so I called my friend who was a landscape architect, I'm like, where is it? He's like, oh, you know, you're the tiger. I'm like, yeah. He goes, right in front of Ginger. I'm like, oh, I know right where that is, because this is Ginger the Crocodile. I'll, I'll zoom in. <laughs> so this is what we call the Cambodian Shrine. I'm looking backwards. So when you're in the boat, this is if you're looking back towards the, the Indiana Jones queue and the boathouse. So there's the tigers kind of hidden up there. But if you look back behind you, right in front of the tiger, there's where the Ginger is, and that stump right there. Do we have a close-up? Yes, we do. Hey, look at that. That's one of the original orange trees. Uh, it's the last one. And you can still see there's something sprouting on it. At least there was when I was there in 2015. <coughs> sprouting on it, but it's still there. One of the upside down planted trees that they kind of turned back to just a stump. So, if you're on the jungle cruise, yeah. and there's the tiger. You know the tiger coming? It's right directly in front. There's ginger. Careful, ginger snaps. Ah, I never did that joke. <laughs> I hated, hated puns. Oh, I hated puns. Yeah. If you like puns, that's cool. I, I invented a tour called the Pun Killer Tour, where I would do all of the puns, literally. And I was just like, uh, there's a scene in the gorilla camp where there's the jeep upside down, and you're like, oh, the gorillas were trying to get that jeep to start. It's like they finally got it to turn over. Ah. So I go, yeah, they're trying to get that jeep to start, and now it's upside down. And I was just trying to mess with I did it the whole way. And people that knew what I was doing would laugh. And it's because a, a friend of mine was dating a, a deaf guy, and he told me that in sign language, the puns don't work. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, what do they say? So we translated it from sign language. This is what the joke is. So we were trying to come up with jokes for deaf people. I'm like, all right, we're writing jokes for deaf people. And like a group of my friends about to give ourselves challenges. And that's where I came up with the pun killer tour. Just every pun, literal as possible, and don't 
crack a smile. But there's the real orange tree. It's still there. 60 years old and still hanging out in the jungle. But I thought so. I have some pictures of this is going into the Cambodian shrine. So that's what it looked like in 55. And that's what it looks like today in almost the exact same spot. And all of this was this. Oh, and that's where, this is where he came from. It's the same plant. That's where he came from. Aww. See? Aww. <laughs> I have another one at home that's much bigger and more overgrown. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can see this is, well, that's where ginger, the orange tree is right there. But uh, that's what it's like today. I think I have some more before and after. Jungle Cruise then and now. That's Schweitzer Falls where the famous backside of water is. There's the one joke I had to do every time. I hated it. I tried to come up with other jokes. Nothing. I did every joke that wasn't on the script, but I had to do backside of water. But that's what it looked like in 1955, and here's a picture from almost the same spot. This was taken in 2004 when I, when I was working there. It still looks about the same. And you can see a lot of the, the bamboo and palms that they planted have grown up a lot, right? Yeah, significantly. And that's the way uh, the Evans brothers had planned it. Uh, there's the dock, and this is uh, the Dominguez palm. Remember the story about the Dominguez palm? Uh, there were 17 different families that owned the property, and some of them had different deals. And one of them was like, if we, if you buy our property, we get to take all the carpet out of our house. And Disney's like, done. Thank <laughs> you. We don't want your house. That's fine. But it was kept secret, so they didn't know what they wanted the property for. And the Dominguez family said this palm tree was given to them in 1896 as a wedding present from a local uh, botanist in Anaheim. And it was a wedding present, and it had been on their property ever since and three generations of family members had lived under it, and one member of the Dominguez family had their wedding ceremony underneath it. And they said, you can buy our property, but you have to keep the tree. And they said, sure, we'll keep the tree, fine, we'll, we'll, but then they had to move it because it would be in the parking lot. Actually, today it's where the Pirates of the Caribbean show building is. But back then it would have been where the parking lot was. So they decided, we have to move it, let's stick it in front of the Adventureland building. And so it's been there ever since, and that's what the dock, see, look how pretty the boats are. Not like the African queen at all, because Walt wanted them looking nice and pristine. And they were allowed to wear flip-flops until the mid-60s. They were wearing like capri pant shorts and like Hawaiian shirts, straw hats. They put their name tags on the straw hat instead of right here where you're supposed to, because they didn't care. And flip-flops. I got my toes stepped on a lot when I worked in Jungle Cruise. I can't imagine working there. Anyway, there's the Dominguez Palm right there. And this is today. This was actually taken less than a year ago. It's still there. When you go to um, the Jungle Cruise with the Boathouse, there's the, the line for the Fast Pass for Indiana Jones. It's right there. They have a little barrack built right around it. So I've always wanted to catch some of the seedlings from it. When they're, when they're my friends, if it's, have seed, they drop, grab them. It's like, they sell those, you can buy a date palm anywhere. I'm like, yeah, but it's not. They call it the Dominguez Palm. It's like that famous. And then Ron Dominguez, who lived in that house, became a manager at Adventureland uh, and worked there for decades at the park. It's also the only place that doesn't have a, um, that doesn't have an American flag flying over it. The Disneyland. It dawned on me one day. My friend's like, is that true? I'm like, I was working at the park. I'm like, I think that's true. So besides the treehouse, but that Swiss people, being all neutral, <laughs> being all neutral and whatnot. So um, here's a Schweitzer Falls coming directly at it. Uh, this was in 1956. This is the year after you can see. Still see way a lot of sky. This is it, uh, 2005. So a little, little bit farther back, but still grown over. And they made some minor oops changes. There it is. Um, this is this old tree that was right in front of Tropical Imports. This is now gone. This is where the boathouse is, the entrance. This tree was there when I worked there. You could almost not put your arms around it, and it was there. And one day I came back the next day. And so this, I couldn't find a good picture of it, but it was pretty huge. Uh, it was gone. It had been there, obviously, since the park opened. And the next day we came back, that was there. Same exact planter, little tiny wooden fence, and then a little uh, pot that they then later replaced with another tree that's now grown up a little bit higher. It's a little, like, this big, and there's a little, like, what happened? They killed our tree. Now, yeah, the, the tree was getting rotted inside. And I got to be there when that actually happened. So it was constantly being worked on. That's why, think about what, what kind of animals would live in there. Because we talked about that earlier. But it was always, think of Disneyland being quiet at night, but the lights are always on, the music is always playing, 
and the jungle is always busy. There's always people. Always thought it'd be fun to camp there overnight. Yeah. That'd be awesome. My friends are like, no, they, that's when the sprinklers go on. Um, <laughs> my friends are smarter than I am. So, uh, but the, they would, yeah, go clean it out. There's wild cats that live out there. You know about Disney has cats that they neuter and keep out there. And yeah, smart. There were, yeah, very smart. I guess in the early 60s, uh, they would leave out poison for the rats, and then they had to collect the pieces that were still out. And one time, a kid grabbed one and didn't get sick, but it grabbed it. Like, Disney's like, ah, oh, that's not good. And so uh, they have, yeah, wild cats that are sterilized and they have vets that take care of them. And uh, we knew where ours were in the Jungle Cruise, and every once in a while they'd walk over the, like, don't walk off the rhino, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time during the day, they were, they were not there. But it was wild being there, but it was um, real wild place. There was one night where they used some new pesticide to get rid of, like they have little fish that eat mosquito larvae. That's why there's not a lot of mosquitoes there, because there's little fish, you kind of see them in little schools, but they're tiny. And um, they'd sprayed some kind of new insecticide in the jungle. And my friend was the manager there that day of John Cruz. He goes, and I was at the dock and I went to do the animation. I throttle up the boat and drive away and I pull into the, the elephant pool and my engine revs and all this, these dead fish come floating. And he's like, what is that? And the hippo pull more dead fish and he gets to the dock and it was um, dead crawfish. They were little crawfish and whatnot. Every said thousands of them were in the river and they all had been killed by the poison they had dumped in there accidentally. I'm like, what happened? He goes, he called it Jungle Jambalaya for the day. <laughs> but we shut down for an hour while they could scoop some of it out into one boat. And the management said, just keep driving the boats. It'll be, it'll be fine. But it was everywhere. And I found out there was a skipper that, um, this was in 78, 1978, that um, they were backstage and they found a five-gallon jug of laundry detergent by the Jungle Cruise. Now, who puts that by water? That's asking for trouble. He goes, yeah, so it accidentally fell in the river. <laughs> and he goes, we drive by the waterfall, the waterfall's getting foamier and foamier and foamier. And it, because you couldn't see by the backside of water, the whole, that whole area was just solid bubbles. So they had to stop the ride because boats just couldn't go flying into a cloud of bubbles. <laughs> I'm like, how long was the ride down? Because we all like to break down the ride. How long was it down for? He's like, an hour. They had like this defoaming agent. They just went out there and poured out. He was like, still visibly angry that his prank didn't work that way. And it, you may have noticed it's, it's, um, the system circulates all the way through all the rivers. The, the water starts by um, Sleeping Beauty's castle, and it goes in front of Frontierland. You can see there's a little river there. It goes by the Tiki Room into the jungle, and then into the Rivers of America, where it gets pumped back. And uh, there was a time when the Rivers of America was completely drained. They were doing rehab, and so River, right, the jungle was the end of the ride. We, could, we weren't recycling the water, and it was a huge rainstorm. And we have a little indicator. If the boats get too high, they can't go because we'll hit. They brought out two big generators, and they put them, and they open up the storm drains, and it was just pumping out thousands of gallons of water into the storm drain. But Mother Nature won, and we had to shut down the ride. It finally hit that level, like, oh, we're unsafe, yay! <laughs> so we got to take a break for two hours while the pumps kind of, because they, but normally they would just dump more into the rivers of America because it can hold a lot, but. Yeah, we were. I had a manager tell me uh, when I was working on this book. She said that once a per she hated having good I hate having good cast members trained at Jungle Cruise. I'm like why? Because I thought we were awesome. She goes, once somebody's trained at Jungle Cruise, they are worthless for the rest of the park. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a friend that worked guest control, where they were used to checking your earring, like ladies' earrings, like they have a dime, and if it's bigger than a dime, you had to take them out. And how about your highlights and your hair and you know, how you could stand, you couldn't have your hands like this or like this, you had to have them at your side, and, and just all these rules, and I'd worked there for three years, and then I transferred to Jungle, and the first day, the manager is leaning on the dock, drinking, you know, drinking a, a cup of water, I'm like, you can't, you can't do that, like, they roll up their sleeves, you're not allowed to roll them up till it's 90 degrees, or if you work at Jungle, and you're in the mood, and um, <laughs> guys, that, uh, if you're supposed to be clean shaven, other places, if I worked to pray, they're like, you need to shave, but the Jungle, they're like, eh, and they have to, the rules didn't apply, and so we went to other attractions and like, why do you guys have rules? Um, but it was the advantage of working at a place that didn't have, wasn't super fast, there weren't roller coasters, we weren't going to kill anybody if we did something wrong, so we weren't as focused on stuff like that. This is a view from the, um, the Nile, from where the elephant squirts, all the way towards the gorilla camp, towards Rikes and Falls. But I just love, that's one of my favorite pictures, just because it shows you how incredibly dense it is. And it, by the 1980s, it had become its own microclimate where there are, I mean, think about tropical plants, they like the hot weather, but they don't like California bright sun hot. And so you have, in jungles, you'll have real plants at the bottom that like the heat, but if you put them in the sunlight, 
and it kills them dead. And so now that the canopy has grown over, all of these plants can thrive a lot better. A lot of um, uh, ficus trees and bamboo, that's in, some of this bamboo is, is three or four stories tall. And so that was able to kind of make its own little mini microclimate. Originally they had, uh, at night they would put smudge pots out that shoot, you know, that, uh, they would do it for orange groves, they still do that. Oil, they burn oil and it shoots a flame about two feet in the air and you roll those out in the orange groves to kind of keep everything warm. And they couldn't do that during the day, during our harsh California winters. <laughs> I'm surprised we made it through this last one. Okay, but they, they built two little towers on each island and they had these giant fans that would blow heated air through the jungle. So during the day, it would still keep the plants alive. So it's the interesting thing about California, a lot of the plants that Evans planted, he was not sure they were going to live. He said, oh, they might live, may not live. We don't know. But there was a trunk of a, um, I, I don't remember what kind of tree it was, but they found a trunk of an old tree that they laid on its side in the rainforest for, for just for looks. And it sprouted and began to grow. Like the branches on it began to grow. And they thought it was a dead trunk because they had it laid on its side. And it was getting enough water and shade to, uh, to grow and become even more beautiful. That's the dock. There's the Dominguez palm again. Uh, this is the original dock. This was taken down after a couple of years. This is where the managers would sit where they could see the whole jungle. And they took it down after two years because they couldn't see the whole jungle anymore. <laughs> so they took it down. Uh, and that's what it looks like today. This is a picture I took when I was backstage, I called this my Zen photo. I never remember having a bad day, I would stop and look, I'm like, oh look. You can tell it's very busy, because there's upstairs people, and that means it's busy. But uh, it's, I find it soothing, you see how grown, uh, overgrown it has become. And that's blank. And then, oh, here's a few aerial photos of the park in 1955. You can see, this is where the hippo pool is now. The hippo pool is here, they kind of expanded it out and added more stuff. But this is, there's the water, the waterfall, here's the Nile River. But you can see boats on either side. And now you have to kind of know exactly where to look if you want to see where the other boats are, when you're a skipper, when you're driving it. But there's the hippo pole. This is where the natives are, where they attack you. And here's another view of it, where Schweitzer Falls is. You notice the water is, is dyed. Do you know why they dye the water? So you can't see the bottom? Yeah, because it's about five feet deep at the deepest. Here it's about eight to 10 feet deep where the hippos are, because they're so big and have to go all the way down. So we were told that if you fall in the water, you should act like you really went underwater. That you were trying to, and I had a friend of mine, he fell in, and they looked at him, oh, and he started to like do the back of the story. Oh yeah, I've fallen deep into the water. Um, he did, he did the water ballet. It was, people applauded, they thought it was funny. Um, here's another view to show you how closely packed in Disneyland is. The reason why when he built Walt Disney World, he wanted more space. Because there's, there's City Hall, and here's the eucalyptus trees that were already there, and that's the back of the Jungle Cruise. And there's Walt's apartment. He said that Walt used to walk out into the jungle at night, and that's where he would go smoke. And he, it was, but you could hear the music running all the time. So when you worked at the park, do you remember that? The, if you go to Disneyland, the music is playing up on Main Street, and then at night when there's nobody in the park, so loud, and I thought they cranked it up. And they said, no, it's the same human that just absorbs or made of water or something. And uh, so, so you can see the Jungle Cruise. By the time you're at the Hippo Pool, you are almost outside the park. You are at the, you are you've gone the length of Main Street. So it's the single largest attraction that's there. And there's a view of the side of the dock, or where the Tahitian Terrace was. And uh, I have a few other pictures real quick, and I'll open up for questions. This is um, from the, the Storybook Land, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to look like a patchwork quilt. Never makes sense to me. But this is one of the more expensive places to maintain and to keep the plants there and keep them alive. And it's not, a lot of them aren't miniature little bonsai trees. They're the real trees that they have to keep pruning and keep them into shapes and whatnot. So that's, and they have to keep everything kind of in the same perspective. Which is nice about jungle. They can plant it, it can get big, kind of look overgrown. Where other places of the park, they have to be very precise and very in order to make sure everything looks just so. Here's another before picture. This is, wow. right? Um, I, always thought, I always thought it'd be so cool to be there on opening day, and the more I learned about it, the more I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. 2016, this is freaking awesome. And you can see the dirt banks. That's the, um, on one side it was the Aunt Jemima Pancake House, and on the other side it was a Mexican restaurant. Um, but that was the Mark Twain, and here's from essentially the same shot. Uh, this was two years ago. Almost the same spot. Wow. So you can see uh, all those plants have grown up, and you can see that's where the haunted mansion was actually right from behind where that was. But you can see that the outside trees 
have really completely blocked everything that's out there. Even kind of hiding Splash Mountain, yeah. is, which is really tall. It's kind of difficult <coughs> to see. And that's, whew, that looks like the future. <laughs> like when they built Disneyland, this was supposed to be 1985. Yeah. That was the year we're supposed to represent. But right, notice Birds of Paradise uh, plants and uh, other kind of common plants. When they redid uh, Tomorrowland in 84, 85? When they redid it in 1980, <coughs> man, <laughs> it was 85. When they redid it, they, um, they, Tony Baxter, you know the Imagineer Tony Baxter, thought if it's the future, let's make the plants more futuristic. How do you do that? And so he decided we should make all the plants edible. So almost all of the plants in Tomorrowland are real edible plants. So this is one of the ones where, well, you can see this is right by where Star Tours is. It's romaine lettuce. And I don't know if they use it or not. I don't think they do, but they might, but they have, uh, this is underneath, this is where the people mover used to go, the walkway, mm -hmm. and underneath it, they have herbs, and they, it, some of it's lemongrass, and some of it, there's some more lettuce, but they grow all of these plants, the theory being in the future, if we're in space, well, what land you have, you're going to have to plant things on. But I thought that was very cool, so it shows you how, you know, so when, even like the cauliflower at the entrance is all designed, <laughs> all designed to be edible food, tomatoes, and all kinds of plants. Uh, and even saw these trees are fruit trees, and orange trees right at the very front. I have more than that. I guess I don't. That was my conclusion. I brought a few goodies to show you. This is a, um, now besides my friend's book, this is a Disneyland guide map from 1956, the, well, the year after it opened. So it explains some of the stuff that's going to be coming to the park. And you can see that there's hardly any trees or anything. I have a few kind of guides that I brought from different areas. I have, um, this is a book written by Bill Evans. This is called Disneyland World of Flowers. They only published this one edition of it, which made it kind of hard to get its hands on. But it's him explaining, hey, look, this guy introduced it. Um, but it's him explaining the planting process at Disneyland and how he chose the plants that he chose. And it was also kind of helpful for your own garden, what you can plant there and what you can do. And I actually use this a lot for making my own plans for what's going to grow in 